So three weeks ago, I began uh, commenting on this uh, Wa Hu Jing, the unknown teachings of Lao Tzu, you know, the, the great founder or great sage of what's called Taoism, uh, which was uh, actually in China uh, previous to the uh, coming of Buddhism and um, has, has a lot in common, certainly influenced uh, Zen a lot. And so a lot of these teachings, I think, are very relevant, very Buddhistic, whatever that means to you. Uh, so I began this three weeks ago. I just commented on verse one and two, and let's see how far we get today. So this is uh, verse four. And then we'll have time to discuss it afterwards. So this is verse four. Every departure from the Tao contaminates one's spirit. So, you know, right away, uh, this is a challenge. You know, there are many things in this. So what is this Tao that Taoism is about? You know, this, this way, W-A-Y, that is the essential harmony of all life. So the basic of Taoism is that there is this essential flow and harmony to all existence, which is the natural movement of life. Right. And therefore, it is the natural movement of our life. Now, in Buddhist terms, the Tao would be a Buddha mind, that we all have this essential uncontaminated awareness that is always present. We were born with it. When we were infants, we were aware, right? Just fundamentally aware. It's pre-language, pre-concept, pre-drama, pre-everything. Pre it is this natural flow of awareness this natural flow of our own true nature, the Tao, the way. Okay. So that is the nature of things. And, and it just flows like, uh, like a river. Right? That's a good example. You know, a river just flows, right? And, you know, whether it, it gets wide and it goes slowly, whether the river gets narrow and it speeds up, whether uh, there are no obstacles in the river, or whether there are obstacles in the river, that the, that the river goes around. <laughs> it just keeps flowing. It just wants to flow. Is that clear? You know, if you've ever, as a kid, kind of dammed up a little stream or something, what happens? It, it kind of goes around. <laughs> you know, it, it, it wants to keep moving, right? Uh, that, is the, that is the natural flow of our mind awareness. This is the natural flow of life. It just, it just moves. I mean, if you think about it in a different way, all, we're, all that's happening to us from the moment we wake up in the morning to the moment we go to bed is we are just moment to moment having experiences, right? And if you, if you took out the story of what all those experiences are about, we would just say, oh, all that's going on is from morning till night is the flow of experience. And then we may define each of those experiences, cut it up. But in truth, all that's happening is we just go from one experience to another, right? And it just keeps flowing, doesn't it? If you think about it, this, our days just flow. Where did this day go, people say? Right? Well, it just flowed. Right? And then when we close our eyes and go to sleep, even though we are not conscious, we know our mind keeps flowing, right? The dreams appear and disappear. And, right? So it's this endless flow of life is the Tao. So the first line says, every departure from the Tao contaminates one's spirit. So it's nice to know that the naturalness of our mind awareness is this flow. Right? That's wonderful to know. Right? But right away, the first verse, he's saying there's a problem. We depart from the flow. The flow's always there. 
which is good to know. That's kind of the basis. It's not like we have to find it. Right? It's already here, but we, we depart from it. And then he goes on. Anger is a departure. Resistance, a departure. Self-absorption, a departure. So he's clearly now, I mean, he, he, could, he could make a long list, but he's, he's, he's picking some big ones just to get, just so we, we get, well, how do I depart from this endless unfolding of experience that just wants to flow? Anger. What happens when we get angry? What happens to the flow of experience? Anybody here ever been anger? <laughs> what happens to the flow of your experience of just going through your day, your life, your relationship that's just moving, all of a sudden you get angry, you get resentful. What happens to the flow? It stops. Okay, is that clear? It stops. Another way of looking at it is we fixate, you know, the, the mind fixates on something, right? Some, some event, some person. And all of a sudden, that flow of experience stops. And it can stop for, you know, it's like irritation, frustration, it can stop just briefly. But if it's really anger and hurt, it can stop for how long? Long time. Until at some point, we let it go, or we get sick of it, or we forget it, <laughs> because something else has come up, right? But I mean, so, okay. Anger is a departure. Resistance is a departure. This is very important, resistance, and it's a very key, right? So the river does not resist the obstacle. The river goes what? around it or under it or over it. It just keeps moving. It doesn't, but we, lots of times in life, something's happening in life, and rather than accepting it and moving with it, we what? We resist. We don't want this to happen. It shouldn't be happening, right? So we resist. We wall off. We, you know, we put our stake in the ground. I resist. <laughs> And he calls this a departure. Because again, the flow of existence is stopped. Self-absorption is a departure. This is a big one. And again, you know, Buddhism, uh, we say that self-absorption is like the fundamental way that we uh, depart from the natural oneness and interdependence and interconnection of all life. So when we become self-absorbed, everybody ever experienced self-absorption? Right, it's a don't, don't, don't feel bad. Uh, you know, self-absorption can be minor self-absorption or it can be, you know, profound egoism and you, you, you know what I'm saying. So, and, and, and most of us kind of maybe go through those <laughs> variations, uh, you know, throughout the day, throughout our life. But as soon as whatever is going on in life, we are no longer open to the unfolding of it, which, which primarily for many of us includes open to other people, right? What's going on with them, their point of view, their ideas, their suffering, their happiness, you know, as, as soon as we lose that connection with others and only focus on ourselves, my needs, my wants, my desires, you know, the my, 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 I, me, my, right? As soon as, as soon as we depart from the flow and, 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 you know, put up the banner of me, I mean, nobody sees that, right? We, we sort of do that in, in our own minds. We, we erect the banner of me. We depart from this flow of understanding and compassion and connection. Right? Every departure from the Tao contaminates one's spirit. Anger is a departure, resistance a departure, self-absorption a departure. Over many lifetimes, the burden of contaminations can become great. So 
Obviously, this uh, gentleman believed in many lives, and many people do. But even if you don't believe in many lives, you only believe in this life. Right? You may notice, perhaps if you have some glimmer of recollection of uh, the innocence of childhood, right? if you have some remembrance of your mind when you were little, remember life was simple, why don't everybody just stop a second? Just try to remember. Anybody? See if you can kind of get in touch with yourself. I don't know, three, four, five, six. And kind of remember kind of the, the innocence of your mind, the simplicity of, of your mind. You know, you didn't, you didn't have a lot of language. You didn't really hold on to things. You mostly were concerned with play. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and kind of nurtured, hopefully, by relationships, and life was kind of simple. We were simple. And our emotions were simple. It didn't mean that as a child we didn't ever get angry or sad, but, you know, they, they, they went quickly. You know, they didn't last. We didn't hold on to things. So see if you can remember what that was like. You might even smile as you remember. Or maybe we've forgotten where we were, where we came from. So we'll say over the course of a life, the burden of these contaminations, of these strong emotionalities, resistance, self-absorption, can become great. He calls them contaminations. Interesting word. So something that is essentially pure when it gets dirty, I don't Contaminated with something, we feel it's lost its its essential purity, right? It's contaminated. It's not it's it's not itself anymore. It's not its pure nature anymore. It's contaminated. Right. And in the physical world, we understand uh, contamination. And we understand when something's contaminated, what do we do? What? We stay away. We avoid it. It's contaminated. We don't think about that our own minds, our own hearts, perhaps have become contaminated over the years, over the decades. And then he writes, there is only one way to cleanse oneself of these contaminations, and that is to practice virtue. So this is very important, you know, because if we just left it at, whew, you know, I've gotten, I've really gotten contaminated in this life. <laughs> you know, that would, that would be sort of uh, insightful, but sort of hopeless. So he immediately says, don't worry. There is a way to cleanse yourself. So when, when something in your house has gotten contaminated, it's gotten dirty, with more than the usual dirt, right? And it needs some special agent to clean it, we, we what? We clean it. Or we Google, how do you clean this thing, you know? And you know what I'm saying? I'm sure we all do that. So, in other words, something's gotten contaminated, but we understand that it can be cleansed, it can be purified, it can be changed. But we don't think about our own minds and hearts in these same way. So he's saying, yeah, our hearts and minds have gotten contaminated because we have been departing for so many years from our true nature, from the natural flow of things, from who and what we really are. But it can be cleansed. And here he says it is to practice virtue. 
And the next paragraph begins, what is meant by this? Because virtue could mean many things, right? But I mean, simply a virtue is, a virtue is something what? Positive, good, wholesome, something virtuous, as opposed to something that's not good or not wholesome or not healthy. So what is meant by virtue? To practice virtue is to selflessly offer assistance to others, giving without limitation one's time, abilities, and possessions in service, whenever and wherever needed, without prejudice concerning the identity of those in need. So it's interesting, he immediately talks about how we enter the world, right? How we enter the world of relationships, which is where, as human beings, where we show up, right? We, we, we don't live alone. I mean, we're, even if we live alone, <laughs> we don't, you know, you know, we don't, you know, you know, we're not on our own little island, right? We interact with people, we see people, we work with people, we interrelate with people, we have families and, and all that. So, you know, how do we purify this mind, decontaminate the mind? He basically, as opposed to anger, which means all emotional afflictions, resistance to life, self-absorption to life, right? So I resist life, I say no to life, I don't want this, I don't want to do this, I don't want this to be happening, I don't want to be around this person, I don't want to be in this world the way it is, right? We don't resist, we, we're not angry, we're not scared, we're not depressed, we're not down, right? We're not always only thinking of myself, taking care of myself, being virtuous to myself, always focused on my needs, my wants, okay? That's what he says is the departure. So now he's basically saying the opposite. Well, that's simple. Now, this is not profound, this is simple. Once, once you see what the cause, in Buddhism we talk about cause and effect, once we see the cause of this contamination, once we see the cause of why we've departed from, from, our, our, from the Tao, from our natural self, let's start doing things that decontaminate. <laughs> is that clear? Let's do things that decontaminate. What's the process of decontamination? What's the process of cleansing? You know, downstairs in the kitchen, we have a reverse osmosis system, all right? It's a water purification system. It takes, takes water, and you know, the, the water it's decontaminating is actually our normal drinking water, <laughs> right? You know, that we get out of the tap, but many people think, you know, there may be some chemicals or other things that have gotten into it. So the reverse osmosis is a process that we put the water that takes all those out and basically just gives you pure water. It decontaminates it. It takes out the impurities, the things that have been added. Right? So maybe that's a good way that, that they add things to, the, to our water because they don't, because our water is not pure anymore. Right? So they, they add things to it. To, to purify it, so it doesn't, doesn't cause disease, right? But then we take them out before we drink them, <laughs> because we want to drink pure water. So if, if, it, if you want to de decontaminate yourself, he's saying the best way to do it is to look at the way you are in your relationships selflessly offer assistance to others. I, I think this is all kind of obvious, right? I mean, giving without limitation one's time, abilities, possessions, and service, when, air, ever, and wherever needed, without prejudice concerning the identity of those in need. That's a very tall order, isn't it? Right. So here we are, right? So we offer assistance to, to a few, <laughs> right? 
uh, we give our time, our abilities, our possessions, somewhat, to others. Mm, whenever and wherever needed, no, 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 no. I'm, I, I'm very guarded about my time. I am very protective of, of how I offer assistance, how I respond to situations, who, what, when, right? I don't do it whenever and wherever needed, and I certainly don't do it without prejudice concerning to those in need, because I, I have decided what? What? Some people are worthy, right? Some people are worthy of our attention, our concern, and many are what? Unworthy, right? We don't care what happens to them. Sometimes we even go, well, I'm happy if bad things are happening to them. They deserve it, you see? So what he's offering us is a different vision of what the Tao means. I mean, we can talk about things like openness, open-heartedness, kind of unconditional love, Unconditional acceptance, right? These kinds of terms we are familiar with. And that's basically, in this different kind of language, what he's talking about. Unconditional love is opposed to what? Conditional love. Openness is opposed to closeness, right? And so he's encouraging us that if we want a very simple way to decontaminate us from this anger, from this resistance, from this self-absorption, open to the world. Now that sounds like very big, doesn't it? Open to the world, even as I say that, I go, what, what, what does that mean? Open to the world. Well, open to the world means I'm open to whatever is happening, whoever I'm with at any time. I am open. I'm not closed. I am totally open to the people around me, the people I interact with. Totally open to them. <coughs> Open-hearted, here to serve, here to help, here to be concerned about their needs and wants, concerned about their happiness and well-being. So that's a good place to begin. If we want to open to the world, it's a great vow, a great intention. But the reality of it is, let me first, can I be totally open to my world? So let's just stop a second and just take a moment to reflect. To practice virtue is to selflessly offer assistance to others, giving without limitation one's time, ability, possessions, and service whenever and wherever needed, without prejudice concerning the identity of those in need. So this is high bar. Yeah. But again, it's, it, it wakes us up that there's a potential here. So just close your eyes a second and think. Let me read this again. To practice virtue is to selflessly offer assistance to others, giving without limitation one's time, abilities, and possessions in service, whenever and wherever needed without prejudice concerning the identity of those in need. So just reflect. Is that the way I enter the world? Again, the world meaning, you know, could even be the people we live with. colleagues we work with, neighbors, friends, acquaintances. You know, think about all the people in situations of, quote unquote, your world. Everybody here has a different world, right? So let's begin by, if we're going to purify, let's purify our world as a beginning to purifying the whole world. 
So just close your eyes and reflect. Is that the way I am in my relationships? Always, when I perceive someone is in need of assistance, I freely give it. Even when it impinges on my time, Do I freely offer my abilities, my capacities, even my possessions to those who need assistance? And then he really makes a high bar whenever and wherever needed. finally, without prejudice concerning the identity of those in need. To acknowledge a connection with everyone. So I see everyone whether they're suffering or not suffering, but all of them are worthy of my attention, or do I pick and choose? in how I extend my virtuous activity. And again, please do this just very objectively, like you're just making an objective assessment to the best of your ability of just how you are. How do I show up in the world? Very closed, very private, very cut off. Very disconnected, separate, just kind of taking, so let's say, an extreme position, or maybe not. It's interesting, and if I did follow this high bar, selflessly offer assistance to others, giving without limitation one's time, abilities, possessions, and service whenever, wherever needed, without prejudice concerning the identity of those in need, Take that in and see, <laughs> see, what your, uh, see what your self says about all that. Can you hear perhaps already the resistance, the rationalization of why I can't do this? Or the other things that may arise in the mind as we even suggest to our heart, mind, a different way. It's very important that we be aware of, of these places of resistance within us.
then in the last verse he says, if your willingness to give blessings is limited, so also is your ability to receive them. This is the subtle operation of the Tao. So he basically is positing that if our heart-mind is fairly narrow in this way, its ability to connect uh, in this way is very circumscribed, then also we will experience it sort of in how the world, the universe, people relate to us, you see. If your willingness to give blessings is limited, so also is your ability to receive them. See, we don't, we, see, we tend to see our, our, our actions and our mind in a dualistic way. We're very much just in ourselves. We don't see a non-dualistic way, which is a, a place of interconnection and interbeing where we are basically always creating our world through how we are how we open to the world or don't open to the world, talk to the world or don't talk to the way in our hearts, the kind of emotions we have. All these things are when we connect to the world and people in this way, we will also be receiving it back. We don't see that, you see. We tend to see the... the we, we, we externalize. We separate. We don't see the, this endless um, flow of energy, we might say, this interactive energy that's always going on in life and that we're always uh, involved in. And what he's saying, the more the, en you know, the more the energy is flowing freely from our side to the world, to life, to people, the more we will receive that back. Many of us, we don't, we don't work that way, right? We're, we're sort of waiting for the world to give it to us first, right? You know, it's like the turtle, right? You know, it only comes out when it sees it's safe. When the world gives it signs that it's safe, then it what? Then it'll poke out its head, then it'll look around a bit, you know, really check things out, and only then will it move, right? It, it's always looking outside for signals to move in life. I mean, look at its hard shell. You know, you'd think, gee, if anybody could move around the world uh, you know, with a sense of safety, it'd be a turtle, right? It's funny, funny isn't it? And yet the turtle with its big protective shell is, the, is like a big scaredy cat. <laughs> Forgive the expression to cats. You know, it's kind of funny, right? You'd think, you know, there, anyhow. But it's, it's like that for us, you know, we're sort of, always scanning for the world to give us, all right, if the world, only, when the world and the people in it and everybody around it gets to be a certain way, then I'll be open, then I'll be loving, then I'll be helpful, but first I gotta get the signs. Everybody know what that part of us is? So he's saying, no, it begins with us. You know, first we need to open to the world. We need to connect. We need to take responsibility for the lives of the people around us and our own, of course. And then we will see the world will respond to us in a different way. Let me just comment on the one and then I want to open this up for uh, comments, questions. So this is the next one and I'd like to do the two of them together because sort of this is, um, in Buddhism we talk about the relative and the absolute, uh, the conditional, the unconditional, and so this one is really about, we might call it the relative world, which is how do we, how do we manifest the Tao in like daily life, right, the relative world. So now number five, he says, do you imagine the universe is agitated? That's a question, question mark. Do you imagine the universe is agitated? Go into the desert at night and look out at the stars. This practice should answer the question. It's very wonderful. Okay. 
So what's he saying? Okay, so close your eyes and remember, could be today, <laughs> recently, when you're agitated. You know, there's something agitating you. There's some kind of some kind of drama going on. You're a little worried about this or anxious about that or you're a little irritated or frustrated with this or you're a little disappointed by that. You know, take, it doesn't have to be a big, big drama. Just kind of like you're, you're a little agitated. Our hearts are agitated. Just, just bring to mind a situation like that. You know, and, and we all have those kind of <laughs> things. Uh, you know. Okay. And so you're you're caught in the, in the kind of littleness of the self drama, right? And then what does he say? He says, "Go into the desert at night." and look up in the stars. This practice should answer the question. So, and I'm sure we've all done this, right? You know, and, and actually this is why for many people, uh, rather than meditation or something, they, they say, well, my meditation is nature. A lot of people say that, you know, I go, I go to the beach, we're in Florida, we go to the beach. I go to the beach, I go into the woods, I, uh, you know, here he says, I go in the desert and look up at the sky. So what do you think happens? You're in your own little drama, your own little me, private little me drama, right? And you can imagine going out into the desert and you look up at the immensity of, of space. And what do you think might happen? If anybody's ever done this. Yes? Your problem seems small, and you see the immensity, the endless immensity. And, the, and what he's saying here, the fundamental peacefulness. You know, you look up in the sky, everything's fine. There's nothing wrong, is there? Vast, open. And yet here we are in our little what? What? In our little turtle shell, mulling over whatever is right. So this is very important. We've all had that experience. So this is very all right. So this is he's saying this is one way confirmation, right? I'm agitated, right? And I look up at the sky and I see. Well, the universe isn't agitated. The immensity of, of the universe, you know, beyond anything I could possibly imagine, space and time, right? Seems perfectly fine. Spacious, calm, peaceful. What does that tell me about my agitation? Who's, who's out of harmony here? You know, what am I in harmony with? Am I in harmony with things as they really are? Or am I in harmony with my departure from the Tao? I've departed from the Tao. I've departed from all this. And all I do is look up in the sky and see there's absolutely nothing going on. How often do we do this? How often in the course of our dramas, everybody have their own drama? Anybody know what I'm, everybody know what I'm talking about? In the course of our own dramas, you know, we're, the dramas we're stuck in, that's only really going on in our heads, in our minds. You know, often, how often do we stop, open our eyes, look around the room, and notice what? When you look around the room, what do you notice? It's immediate. Is there any drama in the room? Right? You look outside. You know, is my drama going on out there? No. Let me get this straight. There's no, my drama is not going on out there. It looks perfectly normal. Hmm, yep, the sky is still up there. Yep, blue sky, trees, bamboo. I look around the meditation hall, 
Everybody looks fine, right? Oh. What's contaminated here? Is the universe, is this room? No, it's just my own mind. Nobody can see it, right? I mean, just look out, just look around the room for confirmation that everything is agitated. No, not, not a trace of it. I mean, it's very humiliating, isn't it? <laughs> like, I'm the only one producing this mind state. I can't see any valid confirmation that it's real. Let me say that again. I cannot find any valid confirmation that what I'm experiencing in my mind is real. Because it's only going on where? What? Where? In my mind. It doesn't have any reality to it other than it's, I'm experiencing it in my mind. And we can talk about that. So, uh, not all of us live in the desert. None of us, you know. So he says, can, so do you imagine the universe is agitated? Go into the desert at night, look out at the stars. This practice should answer the question. So, I mean, I tried to explain that it's, even though we don't live in the desert, we can all immediately get external confirmation from, from our external environment that nothing's changed. The drama is only going on in my own mind. Then it says, the superior person settles her mind, settles their mind, as the universe settles in the sky. So this is very important. There is a, there is a process that we can all do to get out of the drama the smallness, the disconnection, the contamination of whatever story, emotion we've gotten lost in by settling our mind. And here he says, by connecting the mind with its subtle origin, one becomes calm. Once calmed, it naturally expands, and ultimately, our mind becomes as vast and immeasurable as the night sky. Oh, now I see what meditation is about. One of the purposes of meditation. This is very important. We always can't be running out into the desert, right? Because who knows, for many of us, even if we ran out in the desert, we would carry our story with us and not even see the vastness of the sky. Is that clear? Yeah. So, in meditation, like what we did this morning, what did we do? Think about the instructions. I mean, this is more vast, you know, talks about you know, the subtle origin of the mind. But that's what he's talking about. This, the origin of the mind is this open, spacious awareness. It's always here. This is the origin out of which thoughts and feelings and perceptions, dramas arise. So in meditation, remember the instructions? This is, this is the instructions. We talk about, everybody remember? It was only about an hour ago. We said what? You begin where you're at. And many of you, where we began, the mind may have been what? Agitated, right? right? So we come to meditation, we're, you know, we're agitated about something. It could be a big agitation, it could be a little <laughs> agitation. Or for many of us, sort of our baseline is always kind of a low-level agitation. You know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> you know, many people go, I remember when I used to do uh, a lot of clinical work, and part of it was, you know, beginning with... Uh, getting people to relax, to, to, to do clinical work with them. And it was like, people would go, at, after the session was over, we'd go like, wow. You know, and I realized they had never experienced a relaxed body-mind 
you know. I mean, it was like, I mean, like this was an extraordinary experience for them. See, I was, I was doing the relaxation to do some clinical work with them, <laughs> whatever their problem was, and they were going, wow, the relaxation was just, you know, I'd never experienced that. I mean, it was really wonderful. It was very eye-opening to me to see how many people just function at a kind of low-level agitation. You know, there, there's a part of their body-mind that's always a little tense, a little tight, a little agitated, right? And so, it's very important that we learn this process. So again, what did we do this morning? Very simple. You know, see if you can withdraw your attention from your thinking mind, which is creating the agitation, creating the story, creating the drama. It's our thinking mind. You know, don't, you can, don't try to kill it. Don't try to fight with it. Just shift in attention. That's what meditation is, a training in attention. And we learn to shift our attention in this beginning way to something that will, to, to an object such as our body breath, which has no agitation, which has no story, which has no drama. Your body is just what? Yeah, just a bundle of sensations. Right? There's, no, there's no story there. It's just a bundle of sensations, a kind of a, a feeling tone of sensations of, of when we're in our body. And when we, when we focus on our breath, we're just, again, focusing on the sensations of our experience right now, breathing. So we're shifting our attention away from the drama into another aspect of, of who we are right now, where we are a body, we are aware, we are breath, and we, you know, we're beginning to look into the vast sky. It's like we're beginning to raise our eyes. And as we learn to relax and trust this inner space of mindful awareness, we become calm. We become more open more relaxed, which is a very different experience than the mind that is very tight and agitated and emotional and, you know, just repeating drama after drama. Right? You, all of a sudden we have an alternative experience. And as we get more experience in our meditation practice, we realize that these, these agitations are just being created by my thinking mind. Can everybody remember with great clarity all the things that have agitated them in the past month? Does anybody have like perfect recall of all the, not just the big dramas, but all those little ones there in the day that kind of get us a little irritated or frustrated or a little disappointed or a little anxious or worried, you know, or a little down about something, a little hurt, a little. Can everybody remember them with perfect accuracy? How about the ones for the past year? How about the ones for the past decade? Anybody have perfect clarity of all of them? Not a clue, right? And yet, at the time, they seem what? What? Really important. Right? Really important. We think they're real, and yet this is real, you see, like this is reality. Is that clear? Everybody know like this is reality? In the here and now, right now, this is our reality. That's where we're learning to live in the here and now. This is the only reality there is, just this. How can I live in this reality openly, spaciously, you know, all the ways the Tao invites us to be. But if we're not here, in the here and now, and we're lost in our thoughts, lost in our dramas, lost in the past, lost in the future, we have departed. 
So mindfulness, meditation, these are all ways to train our mind to rest in the present, to experience aspects of ourselves, of our mind that we didn't know were there, that we all have this deep Tao of awareness, openness, spaciousness within our own minds that we can experience, that we can live from. This is, this is why we practice. The superior person settles their mind as the universe settles the stars in the sky. By connecting the mind, our mind with its subtle origin, we calm it. Once calmed, it naturally expands, naturally expands. And ultimately, our mind becomes as vast and as measurable as the night sky. Perhaps people who have been meditating a while have had experiences like that. You know, just ask yourself, have I ever, well, just ask yourself, have I ever in my meditation ever experienced just my mind's calmness? Even for just a few minutes. Have I ever in my meditation experienced my mind's calmness? The same calmness I might experience when I look up at the night sky. Can I do that myself by touching it within me? Have I ever touched that more open, spacious quality of my own mind? Do I know it? And then most importantly, you know, can I live from it? Which is where the, the last verse, verse 4, where he talked about, you know, how to, how to enter the world in this flowing way. Without all the resistances, without all the separations, without all the discriminations, without all, all the stuff that stops us up. Can I live the flow of experience? Yeah, so why don't we just stop for a moment. Questions or comments? Please, if you're uh, online, um, sounds great. But uh, how do we live it? So what's coming up for you? I asked earlier, you know, what, what are your challenges going to be? What do, you, what do you hear inside you when uh, this kind of openness of the Tao and is proposed? This taking down all barriers? Whew. Yes. So in the hall we use a microphone so people online can hear. Thank you, Fred. This is a very helpful teaching today. I find it curious that this morning when I woke up and I get into my quiet space and just ponder what's going on and allow things to flow. The, uh, the thought, I don't know what to call it, but the image, I'll call it, that I came up with today was to allow what spirit had for me and just what will spirit bring to me today? And you're talking fit right into this because um, If I can stand still or float on that flow, I pictured a river as you spoke. Um, I don't know if everybody in this room is, or anybody online has had an experience of floating down a river in great sunshine or with a life jacket on. You don't have to work real hard. You can just flow mm -hmm. with the river. And yet we still bump into rocks and you bump into tree branches and I, kind of aligned that with an overall picture of how I can conduct my day, maybe my life, but <clears throat> my day where if I allow whatever that spirit is bringing me, the energy bringing me for today, I can broaden my perspective and accept it. <clears throat> 
for what it is. And then you brought up looking at the child in us, that if we can remember back to six, seven years old, five years old, whenever we could relate to that um, pureness of that existence, the stuff in between that moment and now are all distractions. Mm -hmm. And those are my rocks, those are my tree branches, and you know, and there's moments in my life where the, the river has broadened into a plain, so there's none of that really in the way. It's just a smooth flowing, the banks may turn me one way or another. So I find it interesting to consider how do we lose that? Well, with the distractions well. that we, that I come up with and you know, then I came up with the image, pardon me, I'm all full of images today, the image of a pet dog that could speak English. And that dog was my mind, constantly talking and telling me what to do and chatting and this and that. And I thought, you know, I can go put the dog in another room for a while and be mm -hmm. back in that flow. Mm -hmm. But the dog is always there. So do I listen to it? as a distraction or do I stay with what has this spirit brought to me today and how can I stay in the flow? So I don't know if there's a specific question in there or not, but it is a comment. Do you have any, uh, yeah. any so guidance with that? Yeah, so again, the language is different. I mean, in Buddhism, we don't talk about spirit, but those are just words. So I think we're talking about the same thing. Yeah, so, you know, stay in the flow, you know, you're going down the river and uh, sometimes there's, it's just moving and sometimes there are rocks and branches and you go around them or sometimes you bump up against them but then you bump off or sometimes you get snagged and then you immediately unsnag yourself to keep moving. But that's, that comes from an awareness of what you're doing. You see, so when you're going down the river in your life jacket or your what are those little, those duckies? What are you, those YouTubes? Oh, not YouTubes, YouTube's those, inner tubes. Inner tubes. <laughs> inner tubes or those, those duckies, you know, or a kayak or a boat. You know, you know what you're doing, you see. You know, you're, you're, you're in your boat and, you're, and your object is to just keep flowing, keep moving, right? And if you get caught or snagged, you just go around it or, you know, get up out of, you know, walk around it. Or you're very clear what you're doing and you're clear what an obstacle is. See, there's a clarity, but we don't have that clarity as we go through our day because we don't have the intention just to flow, just to, just to manifest the way the first verse said. That's not clear in our mind. That's what my life's about. That's the way I'm, I'm, I'm going to be flowing today. See, when you have that, see, children don't have to have that because they don't have language, they don't have concepts, they don't have a lot of experience that's reified, so they just flow, right? It's like, get up and, I mean, you know, what, what, what do you do when you get up? Anybody been a child? Come on. Yeah, yeah, you know, just get, get down on the floor and start playing with the blocks or, you know, go pull the cat's tail or, you know, do something fun. Yeah, just a flow. But as an adult, we're well, also invited to be generous to others. Right. So the question becomes, you know, we, you know, I mean, Buddhism has a lot to say that how we've ended up where we have. But, uh, you know, the bottom line is we are where we are. To me, the most important thing, you know, the, there's this wonderful Buddhist story where, uh, you know, the philosopher gets shot with the arrow. You know, it's a famous Buddhist story where you know, a, a philosopher is out, somehow he's out in the woods and I don't know, there's a hunting party nearby and uh, and uh, by accident, uh, you know, they think he's an animal so he gets an arrow in him. I mean, it's not fatal, but it's but he's got a good arrow in him, like, you know. And so somebody comes running up to him to, 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 to pull out the arrow, you know. And the philosopher, being a philosopher, deep thinker, says, stop. You know, tell me. What is the wood that this arrow is made of? 
the guy looks at him go, all right, and tells him, okay, now, he said, but, but what, what kind of bird, what kind of bird feather was used uh, on the arrow, you know? And you can see where it goes. And then, you know, more questions, you know, how long is the shaft? And, you know, what's the point made out of? And then, you know, and, the, and this guy's getting, who's about there to pull out the arrow, you know, it's getting more and more. It's like, what, you know, what's going on with this character? And then, he, you know, and then when, when all the questions about the arrow, but, you know, tell me about the bow and what is the bow made? I mean, more questions. And tell me about the person who pulled the bow. And so the Buddha tells this story, probably to a philosopher who's asking him all kinds of metaphysical questions. And, and, and the Buddha's response, the Buddha says to him, let me ask you something. If there's an arrow in you, your only concern is what? Getting it out. Getting it out. I mean, that, that, that was the Buddha's teaching. And he, that was his way of saying, you know, I can deal with metaphysical questions. I can deal with all these kinds of questions. But it's not going to help you end your suffering. Right. So the important thing, Linné, is that we have clarity about how we want to live our life which means manifesting every day. How do I want to manifest today in, in that flow? How do I want to show up in this world? And everything that pulls us away from that, right, is a contamination of our, of our true spirit. And the more we are aware of that and see these, these dramas, these self-created dramas, why do I say self-created? Because if you look around the room, you don't see him anywhere. And even the other person you may have a drama about doesn't even know you have a drama about them. They can't see it. It's just fabricated. So the more we're able, again, because of our looking, because of our meditation, one of the things we're learning to do in meditation is what? Let go of thoughts. Get caught up in a thought, let go of it. Get, up, get caught up in a thought, a story, let go of it. Over time, you build up a strength. You know, I mean, for most of us, we don't have any strength now. The drama comes up, and, and, and what do we do? Yeah, totally identify with it. Right? I mean, that's, that's just where we're at. So to build that muscle, <laughs> you know, it's a muscle, right? And th that muscle of letting go, it sounds so easy, right? Just let go. Isn't, it, isn't that the instruction I gave you earlier? Just let go of your stories. Let go of the past, let go of the future. Was that easy? Was that very easy? Mm, not so easy. And even if you let go of it, what happens the next two minutes, two minutes later? What? It returns. So that's the challenge, you see. That's a challenge in meditation. All right, now it's returned. I just set my intention, not going not gonna to grab onto the stories and the thoughts. Two minutes later, they come back. Oh. You see? And they're going to keep coming back. And the more we're able to catch them and let go, we're building that muscle. So it's very important to understand that in our meditation, getting distracted, getting caught up, being mindful of it and letting go is the practice. Is that clear? That's the practice. If we think the practice is perfection, how are we ever going to get good at it? You see, it's that willingness, right? To every time we get snagged, to remember, remember, so that's why intention, aspiration is so important, when you know what your intention is for how you want to be that day, you will know, I'm getting snagged. And you'll remind yourself, no, my intention today is to enter the, to show up, as you said, would you say, show up, whatever spirit presents to me today, I will show up for. Yes. Yeah, I mean, and all of a sudden you go, no, I'm not showing up, I'm grabbing, I'm pushing away. I'm, yeah, so, yeah, that's good. Thank you, Fred. Thank you. Uh, any anybody else? Anybody online? Nothing good. So, any questions? Everything's clear. Everybody's clear about how to apply this in their life. Everybody totally committed.
So I'm relatively new to the community and practicing and coming to terms with beginning anew over and over and over. Mm -hmm. And wondering if you have advice for beginning anew without with being non-judgmental, yeah. beginning anew. Yeah, so that's very important, you know, and, um, you know, we come to practice, we come to the Dharma, we come to whatever our spiritual, unfortunately, we show up with lots of uh, bad habits, right? And one of, the bad, one of the baddest habits we have is we tend to personalize everything, and we often personalize everything, uh, you know, in a negative way, which I think what you're talking about. You know, how can I, you know, when I, when I try to be objective about my mind or my life, right, immediately I hear this voice kind of turn it into a personal condemnation or something, or a lack or a deficiency, or is that what, that what you're talking about, or I should know this already, or yeah, yeah. So just stop doing it. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's sort of what Lene said. We have to become, you know, the teachings... Like the teachings, the Dharma teachings that I give, that other teachers give, that we read, are kind of generic, you know what I mean? I mean, they're, they're meant for human beings, but each one of us is unique, right? Each one of us have, you know, because of our own causing conditions and backgrounds, we all, you know, we all have our own stuff, right? Just to talk very bluntly. We all have our own stuff. Right? So we have to take the teachings, the Dharma that we're learning, and apply them to the reality of who we are. Right? So let's say you know that Jarman's first... Ja Jarman? Jaren. Jaren. I was close. Getting, getting closer. Jaren, uh, you know, you're no, you, you, your way, it's hard for you just to kind of look at your mind or yourself objectively. You tend to personalize it, and then you tend to personalize it in a self-judgmental way, self-critical way, which isn't... You know, which a lot of people have, in their, you know, so it's not you alone, okay? So the important thing is that you know that about yourself, right? So you're not ambushed. You always expect that part of you to show up. Is that clear? I mean, it's very important that you just accept, yeah, this is the, this is the way my mind operates. You don't go out of your way to, to make it happen that way, right? It just naturally appears. So that's very important to see. It's not like you're going out of way to, you're not going out of your way to be self-critical. Right? It's like you find it just happens. Is that clear? So you're, you're not ambushed. You're ready for it. And the important thing is that you understand that that is not necessary and it's also harmful. Because all you're trying to do is what? Practice. Yeah, practice. And why do you want to practice? To lessen suffering, to lessen suffering which means you want to be happier. So that's very important that you remember that, you know, so we don't get just, it's like big picture, it's like, because we, you know, self is very petty. Can you see? It's like, mm -mm. you're deficient, there's something wrong with you right now. You shouldn't be thinking like this, but you are thinking that way. So rather than judging yourself or putting yourself down, you go, yeah, this is, this is, it's just a thought but it's not a helpful thought. So you're, you're very clear. And what would be a, at that moment a better thought? That's beginning anew. You know, let, like, let me do this over again. All right, so you, you try to be objective about what's going on inside you. You hear this self-critical, judgmental thought, okay? Now you identify it. It's like we're talking to Linnea about the snag, gotten snagged. And then you say to yourself, what? Here's an opportunity. Yeah, yeah. Let me, let me try this differently. And this is very important for all of us because the way we've always been, thought, you know, acted, it's our default, you know, to use that term. It's our default. We don't have to do anything, right? Jarman, you don't, you don't have to go out of your way, do you, to, to generate these kinds of thinking. It just happens naturally. But it's not natural, it's something you learn, but it's your default. So it's very important when you understand, of course it's going to come up. But now that I'm more mindful, 
and I have criteria about what's wholesome and not wholesome for me, I can, I can do this differently. So it's very important that we don't just leave, leave uh, that old way on the table, that we see it, we name it, and we generate a different way of responding. Now you're building new pathways in your, in your mind. Because it's very important that we stop working the old pathways. But if we don't build new pathways, we're not going to really change. I mean, we'll change in the sense that we won't be doing a lot of that negative stuff. But we really, you just don't want to stop suffering. You want to be happy. <laughs> you understand? Yeah, I do. So, so I mean, it's, so it's very different that you cultivate mindsets. It may seem very, um, it often feels kind of phony to us in the beginning or not real, because we think being negative is real. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of bizarre. You know, you know, we're so used with our afflictive mind states, we think, we think that's normal. And all of a sudden we try to generate something wholesome or positive and we go, well, this, this feels weird. You know, this is not me. People talk this way. Well, of course it's not you. Because you're not really you. You haven't really been you in the true sense. Right? But now you're in a pr process. Process. Remember the... Um, the caterpillar and the butterfly, we all know that one. So sweet, right? Caterpillar, beautiful, colorful wings. No, caterpillar, ugly, forgive me, right? Caterpillar, ugly. Who could, who could believe that a caterpillar would have the potential to be a beautiful butterfly, you see? But if you know, right, if you know that the nature of the caterpillar, the caterpillar already has within it the possibility of, and will transform into the butterfly, we'll understand. But it has to germinate, right? Isn't that that, that what's that middle stage where it kind of chrysalis and, you know what I mean, that middle stage, right? It's got to go through that. So w that's what we're going through now. This incubation period, that's what practice is. So we can, you know, become our potential. Thank you. <laughs>